very excited to have go. We are very excited to have three of our former trainees who are here to talk about careers, especially in the academic area. So if y'all want to go ahead and introduce yourselves and give a little something about who you are and what you do and how you got here, then um, we'll follow that up with other questions. So I've got some questions to ask for them, but if y'all have other questions or follow-up questions, feel free to raise your hand at any point during the presentation or during the questions, and I'll make sure that I get to you with any follow-up questions. Okay. Y'all want to go? Yeah, we'll go that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Carly Filguera. Um, when I was at Rice, I went under Carly Levin, and I'm an assistant professor of nanomedicine and cardiovascular surgery at Houston Methodist Hospital. And when I was at Rice, I worked as a PhD student in the chemistry department. Um, my advisor was Dr. Naomi Hollis, um, and I was part of the, nano, um, the nanobiology uh, Keck program. And thank you for having me here today. Hello, everybody. I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I'm Kendra Carmen. Um, I'm an associate professor at UT Health Institute of Molecular Medicine in the Center for Translational Cancer Research. And um, what's interesting is that I was one of the original um, trainees that you now know as the TIPS program, but back then it was called the Pharmacoinformatics Program, and that was a long time ago, and I won't say the date. But I was um, a student at the... Um, with um, MD Anderson UT Health, DSBS, um, and that was at McGovern Medical School, and I was in the lab of David Luce, and we studied um, hormone regulation of wind signaling and endometrial cancer. Um, and after I graduated, I stayed on as a postdoc for about a year and a half, and I was actually a postdoc on the same training program. And what's kind of cool now is that I've had two of my students, and one is in the room, Peyton, uh, that are now on the TIPS um, training grant as well. Um, just to kind of give you an overview, I do a lot of research in the lab. We focus on colorectal cancer and identifying novel drug targets. Um, we characterize these targets uh, for their signaling mechanisms and um, also their role that they play in tumor progression and drug resistance. And we also have a large part of the lab that focuses on development of novel therapeutics, uh, mostly antibody drug conjugates. Um, I also wear several hats. Um, I'm very active in the graduate school. Um, I'm a chair of a graduate student education um, committee at UT Health, and I'm also um, play a lot of roles on committees at DSBS itself. Um, I'm on the admissions committee. I'm also on several steering committees of different graduate programs. And I've research side, I've also served on several um, study sessions for NIH and DOD um, as both a reviewer and chair. So I wear a lot of hats and um, I have to say that the best thing about it is the mentoring and training all of, um, students like you. That's a little bit about me. Okay, so I'm a little different. My name is Risa Myers. I'm an assistant teaching professor here at Rice University in the Department of Computer Science. This may surprise you, but I graduated in 2016. Okay, right here. Uh, so I did a late life PhD. I came back to school in my 40s. And then I've now, I'm now faculty in, in academia and going up for promotion. So I teach mainly, my responsibility is teaching, but I also have a grant. I have a grant from the National Science Foundation for broadening participation in computing. I have done, when I first started, I was doing a little bit of research in healthcare and I had an NIH supplement on somebody else's R1, uh, but now I'm really focused on pedagogy. Uh, my PhD was with Christopher Germain here at Rice in the computer science department. And it was based on, I was in the NLM program and on predicting outcomes from healthcare data. So the machine learning, data science, and computer science. Now, Risa, you also have some industry experience. I do, too, yeah. Though. All that time beforehand was in industry, yeah. And actually, after my PhD, I went and I was a data scientist at one of the hospitals across the street. And I had a chance to dip my toe into teaching. And I really recommend this, uh, how do you prototype a career is the term I've heard, right? How do you try it out before you commit? So I taught a class in the evenings at Rice while I was still working at the hospital. And then I decided, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm switching. <laughs> uh, and it gave me a chance though, to try that out and see if it was something I really wanted before I switched careers. And so, I've worked a lot, a lot in healthcare earlier in my career as well. So that's great. I mean, that really leads us into the next question, which is what kind of skills do you feel like you need for being successful in an academic setting? So you've already mentioned 
you know, a love of teaching, a love of mentoring, right? You also mentioned that. So what other skills do y'all feel like are important for that kind of career in academia? Um, I, I was, I'll speak first. Um, I think a lot of skills are critical thinking. Um, also writing, because if you're going to have a research lab, you need to have um, pretty good writing skills um, to write grants, um, abstracts. There's a lot of administrative stuff that happens too that you need to be able to um, take care of. Um, yeah. Yes, writing is is very important. In fact, one of the reasons I liked science so much is because I got to be at the bench and problem solve. And as I got higher and higher up, I realized I'm not I'm not supposed to be at the bench anymore. I'm supposed to be in my office writing. And so I had to adjust to that type of mentality and where, you know, I've, I've trained myself now to really enjoy writing to, you know, I, I make a cup of tea and I sit there and I think and I read and I write and I talk to myself while I'm writing. And you know, it's hard, but um, it's something that you, you have to kind of embrace. Um, also artistic ability. Like today I spent the day making a, a schematic figure using Illustrator that I self-taught myself to, you know, to try to represent what I was trying to show in a grant. Um, that's not something that I ever had, but I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> and that's a critical skill, especially with teaching, being able to break a concept down into a way that other people understand it, whether that's visually or through words or through verbal communication, right? For teaching, especially it's true. You've done a PhD, you're an expert in whatever. Now you have to explain it to a first semester freshman or, or maybe a first year grad student. So that ability to communicate at multiple levels of people's ability is really critical. Also, one more thing, like you have to be really good with people because you're going to meet a whole lot of different people, a whole lot of different personalities. We were actually yeah. talking about that before. Yeah. yeah, so you really need to learn for not just those in your lab, but those with your colleagues. Also, collaboration is really important and having networking skills, getting out there, um, making yourself known and your research mm -hmm. known. Ironically, teaching experience is not required for a starting position as a teaching faculty member. It's great if you have it, but it's not required. This is one of the weird fields where, congratulations, you're an expert in X, now we're gonna have you teach it. Go figure it out. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's great if you've had a chance to teach a class, but you don't have to. You'll figure it out. <laughs> so it sounds like writing is a big, um, not important- Not as much in my job. Not more, as much in your you job. Know, I, I, I write grants too, a little bit, but it's not as big a part. So grant writing is more important kind of in what y'all do. So what would you say, Risa, is? It's communication. Just communication. Right. I mean, Make, writing in terms of designing a class and coming up with the material for a course, designing assignments that make sense, that follow. And I, I do actually write grants as well, but it's not as big a part of my job and paper. So then for an employer, what is an employer looking for? What would set you apart that would help you to kind of get that job that you're really looking for? So if, if teaching experience is not important. I mean, it is, well, right? well, it's extra, but if you're a fresh, you finished your PhD, you wanna go be teaching faculty, it's communication skills. Cause right. you will give a sample lecture. And can you, and usually at least what we do is we let people pick the topic of their choice. So pick something you're strong in and that you're comfortable with and you've designed a 30 minute or 50 minute talk that you're gonna give. So it's all about communicating. So that's that, that becomes a key element. Very much so. So when you're designing your resume, what does that need to look like that to highlight? Something I always look yeah. for is animal um, handling skills. That was, so I started off as a, uh, after I left Rice, I worked for a small startup for a little bit of time. And then I went over across the street to Methodist um, and I worked as a postdoc and I worked my way up from postdoc to research associate to assistant professor. And I just kept trying to get more and more skills to add on uh, to my repertoire. So I, you know, I made sure that I was credentialed to work with animals. I started off with small animals. I learned a lot about how to write an IACUC protocol. I learned about all the administrative tasks that I could do it myself. I learned how to do the ordering so I could be proactive, that I wouldn't be dependent on somebody else if I needed a reagent and I had to wait. And I kind of just developed these things and kept adding them that and they saw that, that I was, you know, a very proactive person. I think that helped. So now I, that's what I look for when I hire is um, people that problem solve and that they genuinely want to learn new techniques and new skills. In fact, I always ask the question, is there an instrument that you read about or learned about in one of your classes that you didn't actually touch and you want to use it and learn how to use it and see if, if there's something that they come up with um, that they've always wanted to learn to do? 
Yeah, and like when I want to hire someone first, it's <laughs> you'd be surprised, but it's good that they have would have an interest in science because I have interviewed <laughs> several. I just see it as like okay, I just want a job, but I I know that won't be someone that's going to be productive for me. And I also want to see a history of like productivity. Um, you know, maybe you've published some papers or you know have some presentations or just something that shows you you have something to show. Um, um, so I know that it will be worth like hiring you and that you're going to you be productive in my lab. Um, also, I like someone that shows like curiosity um, and that they're going to want to learn more because you're going to not know how to do every technique in my lab, but you have to be trained and learn different things that you don't already know. So there has to be a curiosity and a want to learn and a motivation to learn. We're a little challenged because I'm in the computer science department. So we've got to get somebody who's willing to work for us for what we pay, which is not what industry pays. So we still, we don't accept everybody who applies for teaching faculty. There is a bar and we're looking for people who are excited about teaching and can communicate well. Um, but it's almost more of a, how do we convince you to come? To, we think you're great. How do we convince you to come? Because your salary is probably about half of what you would make in industry. So there's other perks and other things you enjoy uh, being in this job. but. And I will say that saying we're still probably some of the highest fac highest paid faculty at Rice, the business school and the computer science department are some of the highest paid. Um, but it's a different kind of dynamic and a different hiring. We have trouble hiring faculty because of Texas, because of Houston, uh, because we're competing with industry. So people have to really want to teach. So any questions from y'all before we move on as far as like skills or um, things that you need for a job in this area? Crafting your resume, interview questions, any questions from y'all with any of that? Oh, Sarah, of course you're in the back, <laughs> <laughs> but I can be fast. So while I'm coming up here, just out of curiosity, how many of you are considering an academic type position? Just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, so quite a few. So I have a question regarding the industry and then um, academia. What is the major advantage between industry and academia that you felt you faced when you transferred? And why didn't you go back to industry? Because in my head, I think industry is better, but I'm not sure. I, I went from industry to academia, which is kind of rare. And I can tell you that now I'm pursuing my own ideas. Mm -hmm. I'm able to create a hypothesis and test that hypothesis the way I want to do it. It's my research. Um, of course, it all is owned by Methodist. That's part of the contract hiring. But I can say this is something that I want to study. I can direct my lab in a certain direction. Whereas when I worked in industry for a company, your uh, it's other ideas or things that you're other products that you're doing that are created for the benefit of the company. It's not really. I mean, I have my name on these papers. I have you know my PI on this grant, and that's it's a nice thing to be able to to have recognition for that. I'd like to echo exactly what you said. Because so when I was a trainee and when I actually came to Houston as a graduate student, my whole idea was I'm going into industry. That's like my goal. It was through most of my like the beginning of my postdoc. And then what scared me was the grant writing because I always heard faculty like, oh my God, I gotta write grants. This is awful. And like, you know, I'm like, oh I don't want to do that. But then I tried it and I liked it. And I also wanted to have my own project because in industry, you're going to be told probably what to do and it'll get cut and whatnot. But I wanted to pursue my own ideas. So that is, I totally hear that. And it's true for me as well, right? So I spent 20 years in industry, hit a point where I wasn't happy with my job. I thought I wanted, okay, I want a seat at the table. So to get a seat at the table at a hospital, you need to at least have a PhD. So I went back to school to get a PhD. And then after I finished, I went back as a data scientist and I realized I really like being a student. I like being in a learning environment and I like having a lot more control over what I do, right? I, I, I'm told, okay, here's what this course is about. Let's come up with the learning objectives and then go figure it out. So that to have a PhD, you get a lot more freedom in what you do. And, and maybe it's somewhat true in industry with a PhD, but in academia, I think you have a lot more freedom to do that. And it's something I really appreciate. Other questions? Oh, you have a question in the chat? Okay, I'll come back and get you. Uh, is it easier to go from industry to academia or academia to industry? 
can't comment on easier <laughs> because I haven't gone, but it seems like more people transition from academia to industry. That's in my world. That's what I've seen more. I don't know. Yeah. I had to go back to school and get a PhD to get into academia, right? It's, it's often, I think there's a window. Generally, people consider there's a window of a couple of years. If you leave academia and go to industry, you've got a couple of years where you could come back. But that's really, other than in exceptional circumstances, or maybe if you went to a research lab. I know we've had some faculty in our department who we recruited, like from, and again, computer science, um, IBM, Albaden. Some of the real research labs will come in. But it's hard once you're in industry for a long time to come back to Yeah, I think it was kind of a related question. Um, but for those of you who transferred, you know, you did your PhD, then you went to industry, then went back. What do you feel like was a particular challenge for you compared to other people who were applying for the same position that were straight from academia? And do you feel like you had to do anything in particular before you applied to kind of compensate for that? So it's hard to answer that question because I started part time teaching, and then actually. What cemented the coming back was we'd gotten an NLM su a supplement on the NLM grant that we have here to teach a class. So we had a supplement to teach another class, and I told my chair, gee, now I've got two classes. That's full load for, for our department. So I already had a foot in the door, and I really recommend that, both to see if you like teaching and to get that foot in the door. They, they took much less of, well, one, they knew me because I had been a grad student in the department, but they took much less of a risk hiring me because I'd already taught a class for them. I would say one challenge might be from going from industry, if you want to get a faculty position, you're going to be up against people that are in academia that may come in with already having grant funding and a history of like publication you might not get in industry. You might be, not be able to publish in the company you're in. So you'll be, unless you have maybe an expertise that they're particularly looking for, that might be fine, but you'll be against these people that come in with their own money. All right, uh, we've got a question from chat. So it's, uh, I have a question about the percentage of time you spend doing research and the percentage of time just preparing lessons, exam, teaching, et cetera. You want to take this one? That can be hard to balance sometimes. Yeah. Because um, a lot of time you have deadlines and all of them, some are administrative, some are grant submissions, some are like trying to generate some data. Um, you really have to find your mojo. <laughs> 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 And you have to rely on a lot of the people in your lab to like do a lot of the um, bench work and whatnot while um, you have other duties to get the lab, keep the lab going and get funding. And it's kind of, I always say it, like I have a to-do list, like long-term on my wall. And then I also have like a daily one and then just check them off as I go and like, make time for it. And sometimes you have to work weekends and maybe a little late, but that's, that's fine. Teaching is especially challenging when you first start. Teaching a new class is an insane amount of work. It is seven to 10 hours to generate one hour of lecture. Not uncommon, okay? But once you've done that, then you're tweaking and you're adjusting and you're changing. But it's that first time you teach a class, it's really hard to do. Even And you think, oh, well, maybe you're taking over a class from somebody else. You never teach the class the same way somebody else did, right? You always have your different way of presenting and what's your style and how you do things. So there's a lot of investment up front and uh, one of the challenges I have is I always want to make changes. I always want to make it better. Okay, how do I make it more interesting? Or how do I make it easier to understand? Or how do I make it more challenging sometimes? So it's really what are you willing to spend and able to spend? And then you have these other deadlines. Oh, I've got a grant. I've got a summer program I'm running. Okay, I got to keep going on this summer program so I'm ready when it starts. And it's balancing those things. And that can, can be very challenging. Time management. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, my institute is not, is not a degree granting institute. So uh, we, have a, we have a hospital um, attached to our research institute, uh, which has a lot of amazing things. And I have clinician collaborators. I can just walk over and talk to them. I can watch different procedures. You cannot get, you cannot get a degree from Houston Methodist. So we have an um, academic affiliation with Wheel Cornell up in New York. So technically, um, I don't have graduate students that are with a degree from Houston Methodist. I have graduate students that will get their degree from University of Houston or Rice or from Italy or other um, degree granting institutions. So I don't teach. I don't have any sort of um, teaching percent that I have to devote. So I am, I, while I do mentor and I have group meetings and we do literature reviews and I have, this, this stu I have students, 
um, and I read the papers with them and we all discuss it together and I do a lot of that type of activity. I don't create lectures where I have to go and like in, in this type of environment, we don't have, you know, a an auditorium to give lectures like related to, to um, you know, topics and things like that, like classwork. But, you know, I do give seminars and things like that. So it's a, a lot of research. All research. So, Risa, you had mentioned the perks of academia, and so um, this question's to all of you, but what do you see as the perks of, even though academia doesn't pay as well as industry does, there are perks mm -hmm. that come with academia. So can y'all address what you find to be the perks? I mean, I mean, you have flexibility of your schedule. That's a big perk. Like, you can, you know, divide your day how you want it to. Um, you know, work on certain things. Um, and then if you have personal something you need to take care of, that's fine, you can make it work. Um, also another perk for me is just like the fact that I get to discover, make new discoveries. And that's just fascinating to me. And like producing new therapeutics and seeing like maybe someday they could like, you know, lead to a new cancer treatment or, you know, lead to, an idea of how we should better treat cancer or something, just like long-term impact like that. And that's a real perk of uh, my. Yeah, we're able to publish and create a legacy that's gonna be out there that our future generations, our children are gonna be able to see and look back and be like, wow, great grandma published this <laughs> paper. And, uh, and go on to reporter and look you up. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So getting paid to disseminate research and learn, and I get to sit in my office and read about new things and learn and, where else do you get paid to do that? So I, I that's a really great privilege that we have. Um, I think what I would add that's probably true in your case, but also is sharing that exciting, that excitement and that knowledge with other people, getting that light bulb moment, having mm -hmm. students come back and say, wow, that course made a difference. Or that light, even just that light bulb moment occasionally in a class uh, is huge. So the flexibility, the, the ability to control what I'm doing, I, I learn something new every day, so that's worth it to me. Um, and then making a difference in lives. So it's it's not a, necessarily that I've published something that is my legacy, but it's how do I interact with people and what did they learn and what did they go on and do? So kind of that butterfly effect. But also like training like the like new scientists, like yeah. new, it's like super exciting. Like, like yeah. seeing your successes and like your discoveries. And I just got like really excited the other day when one of my students showed me some data. And it's just like, it's really nice to see excitement on that end and also them winning awards and fellowships and being really successful yeah. themselves. So it sounds like there's a good work-life balance. Would you say that that's true? Would you use that? Risa, you seem no. skeptical. <laughs> I'm glad you're- Y'all been talking about all this flexibility <laughs> and how you have control over your, but you're saying no. So like one of the biggest surprises I learned was you don't get vacation as faculty. When school's in session, you teach. When school's not in session, you can do whatever you need to do. Maybe that's preparing for school being in session. So there's this kind of this, no vacation and infinite vacation. Like you said, you have all this flexibility. If I need to go run an errand or go to the doctor, I can, but I still gotta be ready for class tomorrow. Um, There's yeah. always a deadline. So it, there can, you, can, you can spend, this job will take everything you wanna give it, right? The students, I had an argument with my students the other day. They're like, well, we'd like, I have homework due at five, right? When I started, the person who taught the class before me had the homework due at 11.59 PM. I'm like, well, no, <laughs> because they're gonna ask questions until 11.59 PM. I wanna sleep. So I've moved my due date for my, or the due time for my homeworks to 5 p.m. And they were arguing. I'm like, no, it's due at five, start earlier, right? I mean, you have to set some boundaries because otherwise it's very easy and sometimes rewarding to help the students, but otherwise you're gonna spend your whole life answering questions and you have to, or, or your nights, not just your days. Uh, so you have to find that balance. It's very easy to spend a lot of time because in addition, right, my full-time job is teaching and I still write grants and I still, I run a summer program but the prep for the summer program has to happen during the year. And my, te my teaching load is not reduced because I'm running the summer program. So you get, as you've done it over time, because you're not developing new course material, you're just tweaking it, it gets better. But it's really, you can spend as much as you're willing to spend on this job. But sometimes if you love what you do, it doesn't <laughs> feel like, okay. like, like right. You know, right. And um, but you know, like sometimes there'll be like a whole lot of deadlines at one time, and you know, I'll just know, okay, I need to just step away for like a day or like a few hours, and you know, just take time to myself and like watch some bad reality TV, <laughs> and you know, just be at home for a little while. But um, yeah, you can figure it out as you go along. 
It's hard. I'm not going to lie. I have two mm -hmm. little boys. I have um, a four-year-old and an eight-year-old. And I can't tell you how many times I've had to hide <laughs> in the in the closet or, you know, to, to work on my laptop or, you know, um, um, you know, we, you just, with my husband, we just have to like take turns and do the best we can and take it one day mm -hmm. at a time. And uh, there's a lot of times when I say to myself, I, I don't think I can do this. Like, this is too hard. I can't, I, what am I doing? Why am I, do, why am I torturing myself like this? <laughs> And and he'll remind me. He's like, "You're already doing it. Just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep going. You're doing it." And so I have to tell myself, "You're right. I'm I'm here. I'm still here. Just keep going." I think that support network is so yeah. important. I have a friend who, I think we were in the NLM together. We're certainly, we actually met during orientation week at Rice, and we're in touch almost every day. And sometimes it's just silly text, and it's about life, but it's also. Uh, she's a faculty member uh, in San Antonio, and so we can trade teaching ideas and what work, or sometimes venting about the crazy things that happen. Uh, having that sort of support network and somebody saying, you're still doing it, you, you made it through today, yeah. right? You can make it through tomorrow, right? Really helps. And finding those, those colleagues who have good ideas and can bounce things off you and support you is really important. Are there any other questions that y'all might have about schedule, work-life balance, stress levels? Anything? Anything on the chat? Nope. So now that you know what you know about kind of where you are now, um, what do you wish you would have known before when you were trying to figure out what you were doing and what you were going to do? What, what would be some key things that you would want them to know as they are heading into that direction that you feel like you wish that your self would have known when you were a trainee in one of the training programs? I think I didn't realize. So I always thought, okay, my, my boss just sits in his office <laughs> and he, he writes grants once in a while and maybe papers and stuff, but you don't realize all the administrative junk <laughs> that you have to do. I mean, some of it's fun, but there's like, I mean, there's a lot of committee service that you're going to do. There's a lot of like, you know, how you actually have to set up the budgets for your grants and there's always paperwork of some sort that come that you have to take care of. And um, so I didn't I didn't realize like all the I mean, I would say you wear lots of hats because I got that from him. He used to say I wear lots of hats and most of the time it was a cowboy hat for him. But <laughs> he, he, you have all these different roles and you have like the teaching and then the training and like there's a lot of stuff that all goes into it. And it's not just like grant writing and paper writing and thinking about the research. I think as both a non-tenure track faculty member um, and as someone who who's on a promotion track, it would have been valuable to know earlier which things matter. Because somebody always wants to get you on the latest committee and there's more volunteer and you know, there's all sorts of things to do. And I'm I'm in the process of I filed my paperwork for promotion. We'll see what happens. But when I was or talking with my chair and some other people who are supporting me in that process, and we were talking about, okay, who's going to write my letters? A lot of them, a couple of times they said, oh, this person doesn't matter because they're not faculty. So I'm like, huh, maybe I shouldn't have spent time doing that stuff. And, you know, think about it, like maybe, you know, do the things you want to do, but also it, it's easy to get overloaded with all the things you get asked to do. So it would be helpful to know by talking to someone further along the path than you are, here are the things I'm being asked to do or am interested in doing. Are some of these more important than others? And what those are may vary widely depending on where you are and what you're doing. Uh, so I wish I had known, do these things. This one's not as important, right? So that would have been valuable. That's great advice. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, you're going to get more work than you can possibly mm -hmm. get done in a day. And so you got to figure out. Yeah, prioritizing is hard and also being a self-advocate is very hard. Like I now have employees that I have to protect and myself. So it's not just about me, but it's, you know, one of the great things about having this job is I get to create jobs and I get to hire people. And, and that to me is really amazing just to be able to, to create a job for someone. And so um, I encourage you if you, I have three open positions. I have a, <laughs> a, a research assistant and a research assistant too and a postdoc open position. So I'm looking to hire. And one of the things that, you know, if I were in your position, like first thing, do your research about the PI. Mm -hmm. Look up the PI and look up what papers they've published and try to at least read, you know, as many as that you can have open access to and come with questions. 
Um, so that when you're taught, even better, if you have research experience, show that. Show that when you're going through an interview that looks really good. Um, if you have data that you want, you know, slides or something that you can prepare, even better. Um, any extra ex research experience that you have that's actually at the bench. And don't oversell yourself, be honest. Um, if, you've, if you've only watched somebody do HPLC, I know what the HPLC instrument is. I've seen it, but I am not an expert. I haven't run it, but I'd love to learn. That's all I need to know. I, don't tell me that you can do something. And then when I am actually going to try and see, I'm going to realize you don't, you didn't really have that. I'd rather somebody error on, you know, I'm not an expert rather than try to oversell themselves. And then I find out later that they didn't really know how to do that. So you touched on the administrative part of academia. Um, so where do you see academia? Do you see that as a stable career? Do you, you've already mentioned the flexibility and the benefits of that. So do you see growth in this area? Do you feel like this, you know, kind of what is your, not to ask you to do too many predictions, but you know, like kind of where do you see academia? Kind of their, the future of academia. I'll tell you that our hospital is looking to build a research institute two and three. And that makes me very happy. Um, also, you know, there's this Helix Park that they're expanding. Um, so I I see a research, you know, is a good place to be, a good direction. That being said, it's very hard. And since I do not have um, a teaching requirement, I'm not, you know, I don't have to teach. It's really a lot of funding that is, uh, I have to prove that I can um, bring in grant funding. And so that that's a little scary to me. Um, so as long as I keep trying and I, you know, cause you, I can't control what a reviewer is going to like, but I can, I can put a lot out there and I do put a lot of grants out there as many as I can so that I can, you know, keep bringing in funding and prove my worth to, to the Institute. I mean, mine's are the same thing. Like a lot of it's going to depend on grant funding. So you're constantly submitting and um, resubmitting and you got to keep that funding going in, but there is also a lot of opportunity. I mean, UT health, we've, expanded into the Helix Park, and they're going to put up new buildings, I hear, like, soon for more research base. Um, they're hiring lots of faculty, and I think there's more, like, collaboration between, like, academia and industry than ever. So I think it's, I think there's a lot of growth. Um, but, yeah, you got to keep the, the grant money coming in, and <laughs> right now I have six pending grants, so we'll see what happens. Um, then. <laughs> they all hit, you're going to be right? really yeah. busy. Then I'll be yeah. hiring yeah. every day. <laughs> <laughs> so teaching is a little different. Um, with the pandemic, we saw some weaker schools fold, right? And we've seen education transform, right? It's not all just in the classroom anymore, right? There's a deluge now of online learning, and that has a place. And that actually is an opportunity if you want to teach. There's a lot of places that will let you teach online. So you can live wherever you want to live. Maybe you have a partner. Maybe you just like living in a certain place. Uh, you have a lot more flexibility there. And I think the teaching part of academia is going to continue to evolve and figure out what's going on here. How do we change this? How do we meet the needs of the new students, of, of today's students? And it's going to be interesting to watch. I think I think there are going to be more school closings. And I think some of the others, you know, you're going to see a, a divide, right? Schools like Rice, uh, where we have our strong research component, we're doing well. But some of the smaller schools that just teach maybe aren't doing as well. Um, and they've got to find their right demographic and find the need. A lot of people are questioning the value of a college degree today, more than they have in a long time. And so colleges are rethinking, what are we trying to accomplish? What, how liberal should our education be? Is it more technical training, or should it be a more liberal degree? Rice is going through this revision of the, the general curriculum. How do we want to focus this? What should we be? And I think there's a, a reckoning or a reconciliation or a rethinking or reevaluation of the role of higher education in, certainly in America. And that's going to go on for a little while. And, and there's going to be some fallout. There's going to be some winners or some people who are successful in some schools that there's probably going to be some more schools that close. It'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. We have a question on the chat. To be competitive as a faculty member, is it necessary to transfer institutions, research areas, labs, or can you still be a competitive faculty candidate if you do a postdoc in the same field as your PhD, if you really enjoy your research? So I can only speak from experience, but I can tell you that I did not do a postdoc in the same field. I was a chemist. I graduated with a degree in chemistry from Rice, and I actually did my postdoc in genomic medicine. 
And I think that that helped me so much because I got a completely different spin on um, molecular biology, protein expression, animal research. And that was why I got exposed to new things. And that's the time to learn it because you're still at the postdoc level, you're kind of, you're still a trainee, right? So I could still learn new things, but I was still sort of senior. Um, and then because I had those skills of both the chemistry and the biology, I was then able to transition as a, a professor in a different department. And I'm in, now I'm in nanomedicine. And then as I keep learning, that's how I, and then I got the joint appointment in cardiovascular surgery. So I am very pro diversifying your portfolio and your your knowledge and also with grants, I like to apply to grants and all, I have a lot of different projects and different things because I just don't know which one's going to stick and which where what's going to hit. So I kind of, that's how I pursue stuff. Um, for <laughs> changing institutions, I definitely didn't do that. So I started at UT as a student, a PhD student, then I did my postdoc at UT. And then <laughs> I, from there, I took my postdoc, um, findings, um, which were more focused on identifying um, novel ligands and signaling of certain receptors. And I bounced off that to try to get my own independent funding and transition it more into a therapeutic aspect. But I stayed at UT. I was uh, promoted as assistant professor there and then an associate now. But um, my postdoc, it was kind of, the work we did was kind of related, but I also went into antibody development, which I had, I didn't really have training in, but you'll find that you teach yourself things along the way too. Um, and um, that your, probably your research program will kind of um, evolve as you evolve and as, um, as science evolves, because there's always a hot area and then the last like five years and then you have to jump into the next hot thing. So you have to keep being able to teach yourself um, new things along the way. But I don't think changing institution is, um, it, it's it's not as um, kind of people used to look at it as a requirement, but I don't think it's as um, common to have to do that anymore. Because I see a lot of people stay at the institute that they either got their graduate degree in or postdoc. And I think a lot of that is finding the culture that works for you. Right? I graduated from Rice. I left. And I realized I really miss that culture. So that's part of the okay. Yes, I get paid less, but I really like the people I work with. I like the environment where I am. I like the the institution I'm part of, and that's worth a lot to me. So. I'm not interested in job hopping, right? I don't, maybe I could get more money, um, maybe not. Maybe I could use it as a way to get more money, but then you're playing that chicken game of if you say, I want, hey, I, I got offered X, can you match? And they might say, no, leave, <laughs> right? So are you willing to leave or not? So I think it's really important to find a place where you're comfortable and where you're supported and where you feel you can grow. Because certainly in academia, there's, there's a career path, especially if you're tenure track, right? There's a big career path and the institution is very invested in you. Questions from any of y'all? We have two people that stayed at their institution and one that moved. So I, I have a question. When you were initially like looking for your first junior faculty positions, what about the institution that you ended up being at, what made it the most attractive place to stay? And what were the other like factors that you were thinking about if you were going to move somewhere else? Or like what what were the fits like that you were trying to consider for where you were going to start out? So when I first got my independent funding, it was from CFRET, Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas. So I had to stay in Texas for that, right? Um, then I got internally promoted. So there was a thing where sometimes you get internally promoted, you might not get a, start, a big up startup package or a startup package to start your own lab. But you also don't have to go on all the crazy interviews, which I've talked to people, they do like, they apply for like 50 or 70 different places now. So there's like, you know, there's good and bad with that. Um, and then uh, shortly after I got my first R1, um, it was just, a, it was a supportive environment and I liked the Institute. And um, for me, it, it just, it, it's worked out fine. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. kind of similar in that um, I was a, a research associate and I was writing a grant while my PI was out and he came back from vacation and I uh, showed it to him and he's like, yeah, you can submit it. You could submit it as PI. So, cause you know, I had written it on my own. And so he was kind enough to be like, go for it. And I got it. And so because of that, he then was like, okay, you've now proven that you can do this. 
fly, <laughs> fly bird. And so that's how I basically, I, you know, became an assistant professor and started my own lab. Um, what I love about where I work is um, we have really amazing facilities. We're very focused on translating medicine from bench to bedside. You probably heard that phrase before, like we're taking technologies that we're creating in the lab and we're trying to put them in the clinic in, in humans in use. So um, it, that to me is the ultimate goal. Like if I, I'd love to see something that I've developed, if I, we have a 3D printer, something I've 3D printed actually being used, you know, in the operating suite in some a surgical uh, procedure would be great. We have amazing, we have a, a hybrid OR suite where we have an operating room that's dedicated just to research. So not for patients, but for research related things where a pa uh, a study could be done at 1.5 Tesla MRI and you can do um, all, all these different procedures and you can transfer it across the imaging. So it's on the fifth floor, it's called Mighty. It's phenomenal. Um, it, I, when I get, I get to go down to Mighty, I get really excited because I get to see the Da Vinci and all the really cool instruments and robots and technologies that we're trying to, you know, advance and train physicians. There's a lot of, you know, residents that are around that are training and using these things. And it's just, just to see, see that path towards helping medicine. We're very heavy on um, medical devices and things like that and therapeutics, um, diagnostic modalities and things. Maybe this is the right time to say that the barrier to becoming a teaching faculty member is much, much lower than becoming clinical. Right? I know, again, I can't speak for many other departments, but I know my department and, and typically at Rice, if somebody, if a chair has the money and wants to hire a lecturer, they can hire a lecturer. It's that simple. So now I'm on a teaching track, and to get on the teaching track, I had to put together a dossier and, you know, go through some reviews. But to just get hired as a lecturer, is much, much less of a, con right, I have a contract. I'm not tenure track, I get, I have a, I'm on a three-year contract. And then at the end of that, I get another three-year contract. Or if I get promoted, maybe it can be a longer contract. Uh, so it's a nine-month salary for, you know, three years. And the, the barrier to entry is much lower because if they don't like you, they just don't renew your contract at the end. So there's risk to you. And it's, it's one of the big problems of being an MTT is this level of job insecurity. And is that something you're okay with or not? And early on when I did this, an, an NTT I really respect said, you find something you really like doing that's valuable, that nobody else wants to do, and there's your job security. Right? Find something you like, but then, hey, they don't want to do it. Great, we're never going to get rid of this person because they're doing that thing we don't want to do. Um, and that's really valuable. So it's a very different situation. Much easier to get your foot in the door in a lot of ways. It sounded like y'all funding, and y'all became much more attractive. Right. Fair to say. <laughs> Anyone's more attractive with funding. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So you mentioned postdoc, and um, Karen was actually in a, a seminar with NLM earlier today, and we were talking about how um, there's the question of, do you really need to do a postdoc? Um, is a postdoc important, especially if you're going to go into academia? Um, what is the benefit of doing a postdoc? Um, so can you all speak to to that area? Yeah, I think the postdoc is essential if you want to go into tenure track faculty. Um, that's the time where you probably try to make a high impact um, finding and also um, a potential to get your own funding, like a K99 transitional grant or any kind of fellowship to show that you're very productive and successful as a postdoc. And then that will make you more sellable to the institute and they'll see, like, we want to invest in this person because they can get their own funding and look at like the science that they've already done. So, so I think it's important. Well, and that was the comment that came out was that when you are a postdoc, you learn how to write grants and learning how to write grants as y'all have talked about is an important part of your positions to make sure that you have the funding, et cetera. And postdocs really learn that skill pretty well. Other questions from y'all about what they've been talking about? Yeah, Jacob. Will, I'm coming right behind you. It's very funny. Will had a very similar question to me, but he was asking more, I think, on the selection of institution after your postdoc and that that transition. But I'm more curious about maybe the institutional culture now that you've been with your institution for a while and um, how might that influence your work, your day-to-day -day work, your month-to-month work, and 
I see like, so one of you is at a private, one is a, you is at a public and the other uh, is at a, at a, at a health system hospital research Institute. And so um, could you comment on that at all? Like within academia, how am I choosing between the, these three types of institutions matter? Sure. I love when I drive to work and I see the big billboards that say Houston Methodist number one hospital in Texas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. I love seeing the commercials. Um, I love that um, that there are clinicians that are nearby that I can talk to, or well, I was pregnant while I was a postdoc and I could walk over to see my doctor <laughs> and I felt the safest, you know, if I went into late, I, you know, I worked on the day of my due date and I was at, I was at the safest place I could be because that was where I needed to be. <laughs> um, the, the culture is really good because, you know, you get, um, there are, uh, you get PTO, which you accrue. You could use it whenever you want. That's the nice thing about PTO. Um, we get employee appreciation events. We had hot chocolate last week in the lobby. They give you a, a um, every year you get an employee appreciation gift. You get bonuses for like hand hygiene, things like that. Um, yeah, for washing your hands uh, thoroughly. Um, what else? So yeah, the company culture is nice and important. I. Yeah, you want to feel valued and you want to be proud and where you work. I mean, I think we're all in the med center. So we all have like um, access to various resources, right? I'm a public, um, well, public institute, but we collaborate with private institutes. Mm -hmm. We have, I mean, I collaborate with people at MD Anderson, you know, and clinicians to get like patient samples. And um, so that's all right here, no matter you know what institute you're in. Um, but I think it's also important to make sure that you are happy in the actual department or center that you're in and that the leadership of that center is supportive of you. That, and that can really change your whole view of the institute that you're working at. And that's especially true if you're a non-tenure track faculty member. What's the culture like both at your institution and in your department? Because like it or not, there's a class system, right? There's the tenured and tenure track faculty and then there's the NTTs and then there's everybody else, right? And how do they treat the NTTs in your department? Are you a valued member of that community, or are you just teaching the class that nobody else wants to teach? Because there's a whole spectrum of attitude or how you're, how you're incorporated in your department. And you may be at a point in your life where all you want to do is leave me alone, let me come in, teach my class, move, you know, go home, and that's okay. Um, but my department, right, I was mentored and I wrote a grant. I have an NSF grant, right? I had somebody help me do that, but I'm the PI for that. Right, so they are invested in my career and interested in having me as part of the department. But it, you have to see because it's not always the same. And, it's, and within a school, it's not always the same. It's different, it can be different by department. Other questions from y'all? Hi, uh, this question's for Risa mostly, but you said that you really kind of just went to uh, the lectureship position right after, or shortly after your PhD. Do you feel like you wish you would have trained more for teaching in your undergrad, or was it, or not undergrad, sorry, your PhD, was it more like learn as you go? So I, right, remember, I did my PhD in my 40s. I thought I'm going to leave. I didn't know the job was data scientist when I started, but what I thought I wanted to do was to be a data scientist. So I think my focus was a little different. Um, I didn't know I wanted to be a professor, but I knew actually, so I want to say, right, you can look it up. I worked for Methodist when I graduated. Uh, one of the things I talked to them about was, hey, I want to be able to teach a class part-time. And that was something uh, we negotiated when I went to work at Methodist. Um, so do I wish I had taught more? Race is funny. Uh, they used to not. These, these take a lot of pride in your classes are always taught by faculty members. And what I think they're finally realizing now is we're handicapping our graduates because it does help to have some of that teaching experience. So we are now allowing some of our PhD students to not just be graders or lab TAs, but to actually teach. Um, do I wish I had done it? So the mm -hmm. other problem with going back to school in your 40s is you lop a significant digit off your salary while you're at school. And your partner is probably saying, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Um, so I didn't have the luxury of slowing down my PhD to do some of those things. So, yeah. 
Any other questions? Oh, we got one on the chat. Um, Work-life balance question. How did your academic life slash track change after you had kids? I have a dog. <laughs> and I have to get home at a certain time to take him out. But then I can go back to work. You guys can comment on that. <laughs> uh, so I, my kid, uh, had him before I started my PhD. Um, proudest moment, one of my proudest moments of him was he just graduated in May and he started a PhD this fall, right. wow. which was amazing. Um, cause I, cause he would have told you that mom was always working, <laughs> whether that was a job or PhD or whatever, mom was always working. So he doesn't remember the trips to the zoo. He doesn't remember that I go to school every day. <laughs> you know, you do all those things. Um, but it can be challenging because if you're not working on your PhD, you're not finishing your PhD. So it was it was a hard balance. But you also had flexibility that if something came up, oh, I work from home. Right? Especially as a computer scientist, I don't have to be in a lab. I can work from home. Great off. Yeah, I mean, it was really hard going back after my maternity. I think that was probably the hardest part of getting back back up into the swing of things. In fact, also while I was on maternity leave, I wouldn't I refused to put an out of office um thing. I would still check I mean I wasn't like super responsive and stuff because everybody knew, but I still wanted to see what was going on and, you know, um maintain, you know, talk. I didn't want to be like, oh, she's out. I still wanted to know what was going on. Um it's hard. I mean, there are weekends when it's I. So I have uh, rotation. We have we have um, animals in the vivarium right now, and we have to weigh them every day. And we have a rotation with the with my um, lab where we each take a different weekend. And I include myself in that. I'm I'm because uh, I think that you know I want to be a good role model, and I think it's fair. So I take a weekend where I also come and go in and you know we all send the, the worksheet of the weight so we all know that it got taken care of and we text it to each other um, and those weekends are hard my kids know they know that oh mommy's got to go to work today you know we can't do whatever we have to do it later um, but I'd rather them see that I'm trying to help provide for the family I want them to see that because um, I think that will maybe be valuable to them in the, in the future I mean, my son saw everything I went through, and then he's going to grad school, started PhD. So, yeah, not what I, for so many reasons, not what I expected. Yeah. That's great. Well, we are winding up, so I just would like to ask each of you to kind of say what is the best part of your job? So you can just like a sentence, like what is the best part that you really are so glad that you are in this job? Making new discoveries and mentoring my trainees. It's really fun, and I look forward to that every day. <laughs> I mean, it's when you, you have the student who says, oh, my gosh, I love that class, or I really, you know, somebody went around at Rice uh, last semester interviewing, who's your favorite professor, who's your favorite professor, and I, I ended up in that video, and that was really exciting. Oh, that was like, yeah. Yeah. oh, my gosh, somebody called me their favorite professor, right? <laughs> you made a difference in somebody's life. Being able to say that I brought money to the Institute and being able to create jobs for other people and getting to work with those people that... I enjoy working with too. Well, let's thank them for being here with us today and sharing their. Yeah, we're so grateful to y'all for coming back and sharing. You know, you you were out here at one point. And, yeah, um, I remember. Yeah, and you loved it. Yeah, right. that was way over. They the loved it. <laughs> yeah. So thank y'all. I'm sure they'll be around for a couple of minutes. There's pizza and beer out there. Um, don't forget to submit speakers for the fall in your.